Hey, welcome to Lab the Podcast. We are celebrating a brand new year. It's 2024, which is extraordinary. Amazing. Isn't that crazy? Mm. And I'm excited to share some time with Dr. Shannon Roberts. So grateful that we got to do this. It's uh, been an honor to be invited to the podcast. So yeah. thank you for having me. You're welcome. Well, it's been in the works for a while. We were trying to do it in 2023, <laughs> and now here we are in 24. Dr. Shannon is a speaker author, marriage repair expert, and founder of the Intimacy for Life Method. And for over 30 years, she's been working with thousands of couples to help restore broken relationships, founding a practice here in South Tampa with multiple practitioners, and then moving on to Shannon Roberts Counseling LLC, working particularly with couples and women, offering free webinars and weekly live shows, podcasts, retreats. And you have a particular way that is warm and humorous and seems to connect with men and women. So thank you again so much for taking time. It's great to have you. Oh, wow. Thanks for the introduction there. That was awesome. (laughs) Yeah. Men and women both, right? Right. In your work, it's bringing couples together. And we're going to be talking about marriage. But you have a way that kind of puts everybody at ease and allows people all over the world. You work with clients from everywhere, right? Right. Exactly. With the format that I've um, kind of designed. We'll probably get into that later but yes I do and it's um, my passion and my thrill and it's an honor to sit in the room on the front row seat to watch you know um you know amazing restoration journeys and healing yeah yeah I like that you said marriage repair expert and we'll pull on that thread (laughs) but I was like she's a marriage expert and then I was like no she was careful to say I'm a marriage (laughs) repair expert so that's great Well, when I say that we're excited to share time with you, uh, I mean it. In in the Christian faith, and according to the Christian faith, there, when we talk about uncovering enchanted reality, uncovering the life and beauty of the gospel, this Mm. thing that the world may not recognize, that there's more than what we can see in our relationships. And in the Christian tradition, we can get a glimpse of that in so many different ways, but particularly marriage is, according to even the Christian scripture, the clearest place that we can look. If we're going to look for an embodied expression of the divine love of God, the highest and best venue for that is marriage. Right. So for us and for our podcast and this conversation and our work, marriage is at the centerpiece. It's Mm. the highest form of art in that, in that way that we can look at and say, that's where we see the life and beauty of the gospel. So that's why if nothing else to have this time and have a conversation, but also champion your work and say, thank you you for what you do and keep it up. We're so grateful, but that's how we see marriage Mm. according to that lens. That's a really high view And particularly, like, there's these frameworks in the Christian tradition that say it is a portal. We get to see God Mm. through marriage. But it's also the venue for creating life. It's Mm -hmm. unique in the sense that we don't just get a glimpse of God, but we participate in the generative life of God. Right. Pretty remarkable. We get to create, and that's how God expresses himself, right? Yeah. Yeah. And... It's for pleasure. Those mm. three things are orthodox, like old school Christianity says it's it's a place where we get to see a glimpse of God. We get to participate in the creation of life and it's for joy. It's for pleasure. Right. That's the old Christian view. Mm-hmm. As couples come to you from all over the world, offer, just help us see what's the contrasting view, because right. that's really this high view of marriage. And people go, okay, great. I've never heard of it like that. Right. We think of it in terms of contracts or convenience. How do people who, when they come in, what's the common view of marriage today? That is such a broad question and it's such a good one because um, ultimately when they get there, a lot of them are in disrepair. And um, quite truthfully, we know as Christ followers that even in the faith community, you know, there's so many marriages that are thrown in the towel. In fact, 52% is um, equal amongst couples that don't have faith and also those that profess to have faith. So um, a lot of them come in just feeling hopeless, helpless, broken, um, very far from where they first started with their vows of, um, I can't think of another person on this planet that I want to spend the rest of my life with. And I can't imagine not showing up for a day that I want to do everything possible to, you know, 
participate in in that joy of that connection and to make my partner happy and a lot of times by the time they get to my office those kinds of sentiments and those mindsets and the stories they tell themselves are very different and um, they might not necessarily always view it as well maybe it wasn't for a lifetime and maybe that you know um even as a marriage therapist for so long, I'm like, does that just naturally erode? Mm. Does um, love just, you know, over time, you know, become stagnant? And do we lose the luster that God designed for us? And so that's where they find themselves that, you know, well, maybe it, it is contractual. Maybe we can just um, agree to uh, disagree on some things and um, maybe we can agree to kind of keep these agreements just to keep the peace and keep the happiness and and to somehow you know um, settle for vanilla and that's not what God really desired and and so um, that's kind of where they start when they come in with me just a feeling of we've done everything that we can we think and is this salvageable and and do we have to settle for mediocrity is there more you know in in the way that they originally viewed their um union Hmm. i imagine there's a proverb hope deferred makes the heart sick Mm -hmm. and i imagine couples sitting down with you Mm -hmm. and that's a scary thing yes right it is it's hard to walk through those doors the first time yeah to admit that Mm -hmm. hey a, this is not what we had hoped for, what we had thought of, what we had promised. Yeah. That's tough. Right. And to be vulnerable enough to say that to someone else and to yeah. make an investment to say that to somebody else, that's tough. Mm-hmm. And probably, I'm hearing you say, there's a little bit of exhaustion and like a question mark. Is, right. Can it be repaired? Can it be? And and, and a lot of times they'll, they'll ask at the very end of the very first session as we do a full you know, intake of, you know, their, their stories, their histories, then they are like really cautious and say, Dr. Shannon, you know, is there hope for us? They're looking for that instillment of, yeah, absolutely. We, this can get better and it doesn't have to feel this way. Right. And they're asking, you know, are we so far gone? You know, and it's interesting because, um, having work with all kind of continuums of faith, uh, on a faith-based continuum to the degree that each couple is comfortable. Um, those couples that really try, you know, to live by the principles of their faith, um, they have a little extra layer of shame, you know, that it, they see coming to get help as a sense of failure because they feel like if they prayed enough, if they believed enough, if they followed, you know, their, your, their guidance and, and principles of their faith leaders that they should have not have to, you know, show up with someone that's going to lead, guide, and direct them in such a, you know, concise kind of um, expert kind of way. And so we have to really kind of work through that shame, even though we're in a culture where, you know, therapy is very widely, you know, accepted in a, in a forum greater than it ever has been in our history. And a lot of times, you know, even secular people are going just for good mental health and and good um, growth. And and, but yet for faith based couples, a lot of times there is that layer of still a a sense of failure. Yeah. 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 And the shame that goes along with it. And as you're talking, I'm thinking I I remember when I Cammie and I left the hospital for the first time with our new Mm. baby. Right. And we had done the birthing classes and read the what to expect and all. We had done everything that you know to do. Absolutely. 100% not ready to be parents. How can you be? Right? (laughs) And I think the same is true for marriage and nothing against geometry. But I think in school, we do calculus and algebra and biology Mm -hmm. and physics and all these things that we study. Mm. We there we're not a lot of human relationship, interpersonal relationship, bonding. Oh, those are not the conversations that you have. And then you get married and you're expected to be right. an expert. Absolutely. And to know how to do it. Nobody knows how to do it. Right. And yeah. they'll come in and they'll say, If you can just get my partner to do this or you know, um, this is not how I envisioned it to be. And, you know, we're at the altar and we're willingly vowing, you know, of the, you know, earnest um, emotional part of our being and our heart. 
and then we get to this place where, well, let's, let's negotiate the terms, you know, let's agree that you will be home by this time from work or that you will only go out this many times with friends or, you know, they want them to narrow down the contract, you know, to, um, you know, legislate behavior when um, that want to has shifted. Yeah. Mm. I think that's why the frame is so important to shift and to say, like, there's a recovery, as I said, of a mm. vision. Because, again, if, if all we're doing is convenience or contracts or whatever, right. if that's what marriage is, then there is a pretty fair conversation to say maybe we need a new version or, a you know, we can mm -hmm. update this idea. Modernize it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> let's modernize it because this old thing is really antiquated. Correct. <laughs> And, or if, the Christian story of reality mm -hmm. is true, and that's our conviction at B3 is, now there is, there's actually a meaningfulness to our mm -hmm. bodies. There's a meaningfulness to the union right. of our bodies. Right. Again, this particular venue of marriage is, is, it's actually transcendent. It's a penultimate thing that lets us see God and participate in mm -hmm. something that is sacred, right. which we would say marriage is then sacred. Right. Now we're talking about a high view of something other right. that deserves partnership with experts who can say, okay, well, let's think well about that. Right. If that's what it is, right. then it's not just us hammering out an agreement to get mm -hmm. by, mm -hmm. but there's a high calling. High to calling. I love that. And it's in my book um, that we lose sight of not only it as a gift, um, but, uh, you know, a vision of representation of God's love for us, but the one person on the planet that we are called to love well in the way that we are equipped and, and created biologically to do become our best versions um, and to show up in such a way that we love so well that we actually create the best version in our partner. Mm. Yeah. That's incredible. Yeah. Yeah, that idea. I mean, you're talking right there. I think it's Aquinas' definition of love willing the good of the other. Mm -hmm. it, it, it seeks the other's highest good. Right. And so in the marriage, my job is actually to think so highly of you that I'm <laughs> called to nurture that. Right. And then you reciprocate that. And it's this beautiful reciprocal yeah. nurturing thing that there is no other context like that in the world. Right. Where it's safe enough to do that. Right. So um, having worked with couples for 30 years, um, initially in my young kind of therapy experience, you know, couples would get better. And then um, six or months or so later, they might boomerang back and they're right back in the same place that they were. And, and you know, I just was not comfortable with, wow, Shannon, you can't even like warranty your work. <laughs> you know, what's going on here? So let's go back to the drawing table. What's going on? And um, you can't legislate behavior back into those emotions and those spirit callings. You know, you have to start from the inside out and you have to help them get back to that want to that they've lost, you know. Know, and so um, really going and finding the kind of work that really does that from a more emotional and more spiritual level. Um, and then when you shift those back to the understanding of how we're designed to connect in those kind of deeper, meaningful, purposeful kind of ways, then the, the behavior just follows, you know, yeah. the, the want to is back. Yeah. yeah. I love that, that you said that there were designed, you subtly added that. But the, the reality <laughs> yeah. is, again, we're not at the center designing a way that functions for mm -hmm. us. The core conviction and confession is correct. We're actually designed to function in a way that if we align with that, right, then we experience flourishing. It's not without hiccups and challenges right. and learning. <laughs> But there is a way right. that leads to life and beauty, and, and we can find it. We're not Expression. lost, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, my brand um, uh, really is, I, I really wanted to not only know that scripture was real, which I already knew to be true, but how does that flesh out? You know, because I do believe that God can express himself not only in his written word, his scripture, but in his created word, which is, you know, what we find in science. And so... Um, going back to, you know, really studying that neurobiological connection that is uniquely different in the connection between a husband and a wife and how we function in the realm of biology and physiology. Um, the neuroscience is so evident in attachment science that, you know, 
that same kind of attachment biological system that he created. You mentioned you're bringing your child home from the hospital. You, you wouldn't walk past a bedroom, you know, when one of your children are crying in need of care and comfort. It, and you are drawn to that neurobiologically. It's, it's that thing that God created um, to coexist and co-regulate emotionally and physically with that being for their survival. It's the same attachment system that then transfers, you know, from our primary caregivers to our romantic attachment partners. It is that very thing that the Bible talks about that leaves and and cleaves. And we see existence of that in the way that our brain functions in that co-regulation of care and comfort in that relationship too. And so the kind of intervention that I do is based on the, the science of that, which is very biblically founded. Yeah. yeah, I love that. The book is Naked and Exposed. This is Shan- Dr. Shannon Roberts' book, Naked and Exposed. And what I found helpful about your book is that it, it it's accessible to somebody like me who could pick it up and start. Good. And <laughs> you don't skip over neuroscience. Right. And so right off the bat, there was the address of, you know, what is intimacy and, mm-hmm. and what are we talking about? And the right. beautiful definition of that. But then neuroscience and then attachment. And that those are two areas that are important, I think, that often get skipped in the in a right. faith conversation. Right. We go, hey, it's a high calling, right? High it's calling. other. It's sacred. Mm-hmm. Love wills the good of the other. Okay, right. good. Good luck with that. Yeah. Right? Go do it. Yeah, go do it. <laughs> I, can, I don't know how to do that. This is a really helpful resource. Yes. With what did you learn in the neuroscience side? And I hear you saying that there was nothing in the neuro in your study as you went to pursue your doctoral work and you became Dr. Shannon in this Mm -hmm. field. There was nothing in the neuroscience that that contradicted or overturned what you knew to be true through just the testimony of God and the the, you know the way that we are created to be. But what surprised you? Was there anything in the neuroscience that jumped out and you said, wow, I I didn't know that at that level? Right. Um, We have intuitive belief that, you know, when we feel most safe and secure and um, most connected in our most important relationship, obviously we feel intuitively, you know, most relaxed and we you know, how many times have we argued with our partner and then went off to work and our focus was off and our productivity was down and it just itched in our, you know, inner beings that, you know, something's not quite right. Um, So intuitively, we kind of know that we are in our best version of ourselves when uh, all of those rhythms of those connections actually are in alignment, right? But um, the attachment science really kind of um, tease that out in a, a, such an intricate kind of way that, you know, only some kind of supreme creator being God um, would have designed for it. Because, you know, let's go back to the very basics. You know, um, you know God created man in his image for his pleasure, right? It's the same thing that we experience when we watch our own children in our like image. We get so much joy out of that. And so he said it was good. In fact, he said, no, it's very good. But then immediately after he said, but this is not going to be enough, right? Mm -hmm. And so I know that there's going to need to be this other being that he brought from one flesh to be a helpmate and a helper. And, um, that was the very first us, you know, and from then on out, obviously, it's two flesh to become one. But he created that knowing that that was going to be the necessary counterpiece that we all can function in in our best version of ourselves. We need that extra co-regulator of life that we are emotionally safe and secure and in tune with um, and know that we have another person on that lily pad that has our back, you know, that um, I know you in an intimate kind of way. I can see into you, intimacy, and I I see into you and me um, that we are known at every level, emotionally, mentally, spiritually, and then obviously physically. Yeah. Go back and just slow down and circle that (laughs) definition again, because I paused when I was reading your book and I went through that just the way that you even just broke apart the word intimacy 
and, and it was beautiful and you just yeah. did it again there. Yeah. But what, what did you do in your book there? You called that out and yeah. said, what is intimacy? Intimacy on the most basic premise is into me, I see, right? So you are exposing, you know, yourself to this one person at a, a more vulnerable level than you would to anybody else on the planet, emotionally, mentally, and then obviously the expression outwardly of that is the physical intimacy. And we, as a modern world, will just naturally interchange the word intimacy to mean, you know, sexual, you know, intimacy. And it's so much broader than that. It's, you know, being able to share all of your thoughts and feelings and hopes and dreams and fears and inadequacies and still know that you are loved and accepted, yeah. right? Yeah, I love that picture of it being holistic in that it's all of me, my mm. thoughts, my emotions, my uh, vulnerability, my physical life, mm. it, all of that passes into you and you to me. That's That kind of intimacy is what I think we are wired for, right? Right, right. And the attachment, I've loved it in the emotionally focused therapy world that the, just the drumbeat of bonding, mm -hmm. bonding, bonding, right? right? Like we're made to be in this bonded, Correct. connected relationship. What did you learn about like how uh, you call out the particular types of attachment, you know, mm -hmm. that there can be these different forms based on nature and nurture that our right. experience right help people just get a glimpse that of what that is. Cause again, mm -hmm. we can use a big brush and say, well, attachment is good, right? Bonding right. is good. And under that they're depending on our story, right? We might be living unknowingly in this framework of attachment. That's maybe not the healthiest. Right. What are some of those kind of categories of attachment that you yeah. call out in your book and maybe then I can pull on that thread a little bit. Cause I found that really interesting right. for people that maybe they don't know that language, but they're right. living that. Yeah. A actually, it's um, kind of become a lot more um, popular in the, you know, um, literature world and becoming you know, normalized in the in layperson's um, terminology, too, it, which is wonderful and fascinating. Um, but for the most part, an attachment figure um, is defined where um, you have that f emotional and physical um, feeling of safety and security based on kind of two elements, very simple, a, a safe haven where we turn to in times of need, um, whether that's physical or emotional, and it, a, a secure base, um, the thought of you that I can go out into my world and be my most independent best self. So safe haven, secure base are the two definitions. And by definition, um, you know, that is what a primary caregiver gives. You know, children are able to laugh and play on a playground, but every once in a while look back and just make sure you're still there. And as, if you're there, that, that feeling of assurance allows them to continue to go and experience the world and, and play. But if that secure base isn't there obviously the play doesn't resume um, they you know run around looking for you or calling for you or crying until you come and make them feel safe again and so on that same basis that's the thing that we also look for in obviously in different kinds more a more mature way we have a desire to want to call out or lean in or reach for our partner in times of uncertainty and care or comfort or sickness or the assurance that they we carry the thought of them with us into our world to do our, our calling and our purpose and our work. Um, and so that's how we define a secure and safe attachment figure is when we have those two knowledges of a safe haven to fall and a secure base in which to go out. Um, and what happens through our, you know, broken world and our broken relationships is that sometimes we are, the message shifts and changes. Um, not that we've all had perfect parenting growing up, um, but, you know, for the most part, sometimes we learn that it's not safe to call out or reach for our partner, or we have to do it in a really loud or kind of, um, you know, prickly kind of way, you know, um, not every adult likes to lean into a crying tantrum, you know, adult, um, partner. But, um, so sometimes in the way that we reach out or if we even reach out to our partner it becomes kind of somewhat broken. 
Um, and a lot of the couples that come in, um, we do map that disconnect cycle that, you know, in times of I'm not sure of you, um, how do we let our partner know we're not feeling safe or secure? Or do we? Do we call out? Do we reach out? And how do we do that? That is allowing our partner to respond in caring and loving kind of ways and so it's a it's a two-way dance Mm -hmm. right it has to have a call out um, that invites your partner towards and then your partner has to be willing to move towards and so some of those um, interactions and those um, I call them disconnect fight cycles um, don't necessarily promote that reconnection point that we're designed to have in um, relationships when we need that care and comfort. Yeah. It's, again, why I think this is such a great resource, Naked and Exposed, Dr. Shannon Roberts. I love the accessibility of, again, the neuroscience, the attachment theory, all of those things that you worked really hard to, to gain mastery of, but then translate mm-hmm. to where you can say, hey, at the end of the day, you know, a right. safe haven in this harbor. You know, you need a harbor and you need a base. Right. These things are true. Right. Let's help you develop that. And even as you were talking there, I thought that the thing I get so excited about is, again, if we can recover a high view of marriage in our culture Mm -hmm. and we can agree, which I think we intuitively know there is an otherness to it. There is a sacredness to it that we want to give it that. But then there's this whole cultural message that's deconstructed that. Be independent. You don't need anybody. You can become your own kind of best self on your own. You know, you don't, this big coin term codependency, you know, is uh, not good. You know, um, I can't rely on, I can't need another. And there's such a big difference between um, what we've demonized in codependency that's very, very distinctly different from interdependency. Mm. And um, so a lot of times that messaging has gotten a little misconstrued. Yeah, what a beautiful thing, interdependency and the call to that. But I love that if we can get that recovery and there's an enchanting invitation back to a high view of marriage, that it is possible, mm-hmm. and you just did it there, to say there are tools and there's a way of right. approaching relationship, mm-hmm. even if we just r- gain common language, mm-hmm. that I don't have to get a PhD in attachment theory, but I can understand what it right. is, maybe what my story uh, had in it that mm-hmm. that harmed or limited me in those areas, right. and now how I can start to repair that Right. So that it doesn't repeat again in my intimate relationship or with my kids. Right. And right. it's possible. I mean, it is even, possible. Yeah. Yeah. Neural pathways are real. I mean, that's why I go into the neuroscience that, you know, if our messaging, um, it, whether it was from, you know, childhood or other romantic attachment, you know, relationships or even the relationship itself that they're in um, has promoted like a disconnect then sometimes that way of how we reach out or if we reach out to our partner during those times is broken and so the more we travel that path the more it becomes primary that if I have the thought of or the feelings of um, my my spouse isn't there for me um, or I I don't feel important or prioritized or loved or accepted, um, I shut down, you know, um, for example, if we travel that over and over again, it does create this neural pathway that leads us into self-protection, you know, um, where we move into more of our, our primitive brain, our reptilian self-protective brain, where we either ramp up or fight or, uh, move away or flight or we shut down or freeze and that is the broken system of where couples a lot of times find themselves that I I don't feel like I can reach or I, I feel like I have to really escalate you know my you know protest against or um, I have to turn away from the relationship to go get my needs met elsewhere yeah Mm-hmm. When just the being stuck in those patterns of survival mm-hmm. that served us yes. and for whatever early on in our Absolutely. story, whatever we learned these ways to survive. Right. And now to avoid pain. Yeah. Right. I mean, it's very simple. We, we do what, um, 
is really natural. Nobody wants to feel pain in, emotionally, and our bodies respond to the threat of emotional pain equally the same as the threat of physical. And we feel it the most in our attachment relationships and marriage that it matters most to us how we perceive um, our partner, you know, being there for us or not being there for us. That's it matters the most. Yeah. Yeah. So good. I'm just sitting here thinking for everybody who's listening and we go, okay, yes, A, as a community, um, recovering that high view, B, there are ways that we can partner with people Mm -hmm. who there's no shame, no guilt, no uh, embarrassment about saying, I would love to get an expert, somebody to walk alongside and equip me in this way and help me repair. Mm -hmm. I'm a yes to that. Right. For the person who's listening to this and goes, yeah, but my story, like, (laughs) I don't even know where to start. Like, how do you help a couple when somebody reaches out to you and says, I hear what you're saying Mm -hmm. and I see it and I love that and Mm -hmm. that's what I want. But my reality day to day is that it's, there's a lot of resentment, a lot of mistrust. Absolutely. What do I do? What, how do you start with couples who find themselves feeling a little paralyzed by, by where they're at? You know, that's such a great question, and I'm glad that you decided to highlight that because um, in in the past when we've done, you know, some other kinds of interventions, um, therapists, you know, it's been pretty prescriptive. You know, we've talked to them about speaker listener skills, and we've talked to them about, you know, fair fighting rules, and and that's all well and good if they have someone that kind of monitors all of that and plays referee in the room, and and, and it never habituates when they get home, you know, because quite honestly, those natural neurobiological kind of forces, you know, kick in and they happen in nanoseconds, you know, and, and emotions are real. And, um, so you really have to have that experience to happen in the safety and and security of, of the, you know, counseling room to create new neural pathways. You know, God made our, um, minds amazingly, um, even though we don't get our new minds till later, um, those neural pathways are, are there, but we have the ability to recreate through the neuroplasticity of our, our, our um, brains to um, create those go arounds where if we can experience our partner in a different kind of way in the way that we if we make ourselves vulnerable and our partner responds in different kind of ways, they actually even though they might have been uh, a participant in the creation of that disconnect cycle, they can learn how to then be that in that high calling of a healing partner. And um, we re-experience our partners in a, a very safe and secure way in the confines of the, um, the counseling room and um, create those neural pathway connections that we travel over and over again. And it does habituate at home. And, you know, Brene Brown is a a big, um, you know, guru for me. I I, I love her um, research that vulnerability met with empathy brings healing. And so creating the space of safe and secure um, where both partners are experiencing the risk of trying again and opening up those um, passageways of hope and vulnerability and the partner is able and um um, knows how to move towards that and we get to re-experience that process of healing in in the in the confines of the room first yeah I love that even in your approach of intensives where people get access to come and like immerse themselves in that kind of learning right. so that they can mm-hmm. I, I think you said it so well once you experience something it's, it's you easy can, to yeah, repeat. you can repeat it. Like yeah. if you try to teach me to dance and I <laughs> read about it, right? I can read about it. I can repeat it back to you. But until I've had success a couple times, Ugh. feeling what it feels Correct. like when we got that turn. Right. Your, now I think it's possible. Your stories change again. It goes back to that old story of, well, maybe you are the guy or the woman that God had for me and I do see you in a different kind of way and that want to you know we've taken a little bit of a dip in the toe in the shallow end and that went okay and so now maybe I can wade into my knees and you know it's a slow process of warming back up and feeling like I can expose at the same time that I am unashamed and accepted again we can get there again. 
Yeah, I think that's possible. Lewis writes on bicycles, yeah. this idea of re-enchantment. Mm. And, you know, the first time I saw a bicycle or rode a bicycle, right. it was magical. Right. And then it becomes pretty normal. Right. And then You it don't notice the wind in your face anymore. Yeah. It just feels like part of the process, right? Yeah. And then it gets set aside, left in the rain. But then I find it again. Mm. And I experience what I once knew. Right. And I think it's possible. So I love your work. Uh, this is so beautiful. Um, to get time talking about this, and especially in January as we start a new year. New year, new us. Yeah. Right. Here we are at the beginning of a new year, and I think if we're going to see the life and beauty of the gospel in the world, right. if we can all agree, like, hey, if it takes place in intimate relationship, mm -hmm. and it takes place in how we're preparing for intimate relationship, and we have that high view, and right. we get to work. So why, this is my shameless plug. You didn't ask <laughs> me for this, but you think about what it costs to buy a Disney pass, or we invest thousands of mm -hmm. dollars to escape our pain, to flee from it, to medicate mm -hmm. it, to whatever. Right. I think there's no better investment than say, let's get really good at this. And if I can learn to dance like that, mm -hmm. if I can learn to see my relationship flourish like that, that's it's beautiful. I'm right. thinking of the single person right now. Okay. Who's listening to this and they're like, okay, great. <laughs> How can I begin to put myself in a position to experience the best start to that journey of growth mm, with another person? Right. What would you say? Would you say it's important to think a little bit about your story and attachment? Is there some work that isn't normally done that could yeah. be done? What would you say to a single person? who says, I want that high calling. How can I put myself in the best position for that? Right. I think it's the definition, right? I mean, how much are we are telling our, you know, um, our single people that, oh, go find your soulmate. Um, go look for that one that makes you feel good. Um, make sure that they check all your boxes, the list, right? In all reality, it, it really is, what, what if we shifted that, you know, mindset to be, what do I need to know and understand about myself and how I can show up in the best way to love my partner the way that God calls me to love a partner? And that is, you know, the number one uh, thing that couples come in and they, they, you know, without flaw, we just don't, we're not on the same page. We don't, we can't communicate anymore. Um, it, it doesn't feel like we can um you know, have conversations and they go well. There's no work throughs. There's no um, circle back around and make sure we have, you know, healing conversations or repair. It's communication. Um, it, that is the number one key. And it's the number one um, thing that what we know to be true with John Gottman's research is, is the thing that can be the biggest predictor of, you know, relationship dissatisfaction, intimacy, erosion, and eventual predict or a divorce. So learning yourself and knowing how, what, what do you do in those times of uncertainty when you don't feel, um, connected or do you reach in ways that leave yourself open and vulnerable? And are you able to move towards people, even if they're giving you the message that I didn't like that very much, you know, how are you responding to those kinds of crucial moments of do we know how to have the skills to share openly and then do we know how this that to have the skills to respond empathically yeah. you know that would be probably a good start <laughs> i love it yeah. and and communication in general right mm -hmm. we're devolving to the point of emojis or little symbols that we're right but when you get in a human intimate relationship and somebody says how's your day right the, you know, that's why I say read poetry. Like, <laughs> let's go. Uh, how about to the person who's in a good relationship? Mm -hmm. Say, hey, we're fine. Yeah. We're fine. Yeah. Kids are good. House is good. Life right. is good. And. Yes. Yeah. It's, yeah, right. I get those couples too. Um, I, you know, have this precious couple now and, you know, they've been married a long time and they're transitioning, you know, from having raised their family, having, you know, put a lot of effort and, um, you know, uh, a lot of their focus on their career. And now they're kind of at the end of both of those, you know, mm -hmm. and rediscovering, okay, what's next in our chapter? We've worked really hard to get to this place. And, Everything that we've kind of focused on, we've kind of left the oxy oxygen mask on the most important thing. And so it's not that it's bad, but 
can it be better? I mean, can we, you know, really thrive in these, you know, really great chapters that we finally find ourselves in, into where we don't have all the distractions of everything that the world tells us that we are needing to focus on. And we have time and we have luxury of, you know, um, our finances and, We don't have as much effort um, to have to focus on outside of our internal world. And so let's take a check, you know, is, is this the, what, how we want to spend the rest of our lives being And yes, it's good, but is it great? I mean, I, I'm kind of a, you know, a, a, uh, you know, nerd. I, I like to observe human behavior and kind of uh, an admission I need to ha- uh, probably say is every time I'm in any kind of place, whether it's a social gathering, a party or a restaurant, or I'm looking around at the couples, you know, and I can probably look hard and fast enough to know, okay, they're on a first date. You can kind of tell the coyness and the, you know, deer in the headlight or they're freshly, you know, a a thing or engaged because they're not even sitting on opposite side of the tables. They're like touching from head to toe on their sides, you know, and um, then those couples that, you know, you can tell they're exhausted because, you know, they're coming in two different cars and two different times and trying to make this date night thing happen and you know they're you know got their notes out on kind of calendaring and you know trying to do the business you know get it all tucked in on you know at the same time and then there's also the couple that have just waned you know and they're you know on the on the on each other's phone and they're not having a whole lot of conversation and and so but then you see that couple you know the ones that are more seasoned and they are still in that place of holding hands and laughing and the twinkle in their eye. And you're just thinking, oh, love is still alive. They, they found the secret sauce again. And a lot of couples will come in and say, and I want to find that secret sauce again. How do we get back to that place of, you know, beyond just, you know, um, companionship and commitment? Where Can we get back to the, the chemistry too? And so we, I, I do have those couples as well. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's uh, uh, Again, thank you for the work because it's like having a superpower when you're walking <laughs> around and you see all of that and you're like, oh, wow, there's a lot. Of <laughs> so for the person, I know we're running on time. I, Riley's great. He keeps me honest. <laughs> I told oh, it's going to be 35 minutes. Here we are. You know. I can always get caught up okay. in this. It's just the love of my life. So. <laughs> I'll, do some, I'll do some lightning rounds to get us okay. out of here. But here's, I can't leave without thinking about the person who says, I've tried We've been through therapist one, therapist mm-hmm. two. We've tried every different thing. Right. And now I feel like I'm being hurt. Yeah. And I can't put words to it because right. it's not physical abuse. It's not sexual abuse. Yeah. But but emotionally. It feels like I have to self-protect. Yeah. yeah. I'm mm-hmm. hurting. Right. And maybe I go to a church. And yeah. so I feel like I can't necessarily, I don't want to cast a bad light on my partner. Right. I don't want to have the shame of our family going through something, right. but I am enduring this pain and I don't know if it's okay to say that this is painful. Ouch. Uh-huh. Yeah. I, what is. do you say to that yeah. person and how do you, how, what could they do even today to kind of have an affirmation that, okay, that's real and valid. Right. Um, gosh, I have a lot to say to that person because I'm just, um, I, my heart goes out. Um, I know it from a personal and a professional um, position, but um, don't give up. Don't give up hope. Um, it's, a, it's a privilege if you get two people in the room that are saying we want to do this work and it's not a failure to say we've tried and stabbed at it several different times, um, but it's worth the work. You know, 40% of the effectiveness of counseling is just finding the right therapist and the right fit. Um, make sure you get to a, a very seasoned therapist that really knows how to handle the hurt and pain in the room and can um, walk. I have three clients in my office. I have him and I have her and then I have that relationship, us, and really each one has to be handled very delicately and fragilely and you don't go right into those hurt and pain points you really have to build rebuild a foundation so that the couple knows how to go into that and have a a change event happen in in the room a healing process happen in the room and that takes time a lot of couples you know will start the counseling process and they'll go through a, a few rounds of you know counseling and you know whether it's time our finances or, you know, um, you know, just 
a disappointment that they weren't having, you know, fast results, might give up on the process and maybe even check the box and say, yeah, we tried that counseling thing and it didn't work. And I'm just saying, don't, don't give up the work, you know, find the right fit, hunker down and do the all the way through the A to Z. I think that's why the intensive has been so beneficial in, in my couples because the couples that go through the two day in, intensive work, two days, 16 hours, which is like four to six months worth of counseling in two days, it works for the busy model that we find our families in today. And then the six month follow up allows them to stay on course. So they get all of that intervention up front and they get fast relief. And then, you know, they have the support network to make sure that they stay on track it, it really works well um, for those couples that find themselves in that place where how am I going to dedicate that kind of space and time to do that kind of work um, but I have found that those kinds those couples that are really saying we're not going to give up on the most important thing we're going to roll up our sleeves and we're going to figure this out and we're going to keep at it and um, that model those couples that go through the two-day and the follow-up program and we're seeing 90 percent success rate that's incredible. Yeah. Absolutely incredible. And people from all over the world, you work remote, <laughs> Zoom, people fly in. Right. If somebody's listening to this on the other side of the country or right. world mm -hmm. and they go, okay, I want to reach out. Okay. And your your website is where you've said direct them there. Shannon All Roberts things Counseling. Dr. Shannon are found on my website. That's at shannonrobertscounseling.com. My name is spelled with one N. Thanks, Mom. Um, shannonrobertscounseling.com has all things um, Dr. Shannon. So whether that's um, a place where you can go and get my book or whether you want the link to where my podcast is um, or whether you want more information about my counseling services, it's all right there. Yeah, that's awesome. Here, let's do this as we start the new year. I would just put an invitation out. A, if you're single, um, let's start thinking well. Go back, listen to this episode again, and, and just find the places where there may be a second question or follow-up question that you want to ask. And send them our way or send them direct to Dr. Shannon. I'd be right. curious like what this provokes in mm. each of you. Uh, and then let's think well and recover that high view of marriage. And if you're married... Just, I, I want to give you an invitation to take a minute and think about where you're at in your relationship. And you'll probably find yourself somewhere on that spectrum of what Dr. Shannon described. And maybe we can just offer a collective like, yes, right. if this is where the life and beauty of the gospel is most precisely so, visible, mm. then maybe in 24, this is the year that we can water that garden a little bit more. So Dr. Shannon, thank you for Absolutely. helping us put that at the very forefront of 2024. Absolutely. Um, thank you for your work. And okay. shannonrobertscounseling.com is where to go. Naked and Exposed is the book. And we'll probably end up inviting you back. I, I can imagine two or three other conversations <laughs> that I want to have. So, but thank awesome. you so much for your work. I love it. Thank All you right. so much. Take care.